Okay. Number 128. Uh, today is, uh, we've got winners. Kevin LaFoon in Arkansas wins the easel brush clip. And uh, Martha Hollett in Indiana wins the Plein Air Magazine April apron. So congrats to both of you. Today is day number 128 live. And that means we have been here 128 days in a row. And you can tell because I'm starting to get sloppy. I'm just saying, you know, I'm late today. I had to reboot my computer. I was just ready to go on. Yesterday, I had a problem with the sound. And what had happened is, uh, so I, I bought a couple of air conditioners for this room. And as a result, it blew the breaker right before I went on the air. And it turned off the audio. And I didn't know that. So hopefully, the audio is working now. Uh, if there's no audio, you guys will say it in the comments. So uh, thank you. For and the farmer's market is, uh, I, I took a couple pictures of it. I should share them. But the idea is that we have to go in one way. We sanitize our hands before we go in. We have to stand six feet apart. And there are lines for every booth. And so... And so we, anyway, we did the farmer's market. We did a little antiquing this morning. I bought a, a really beautiful old antique picture frame. Now I got to paint a picture for it. Sometimes I do that. I'll buy a frame and then and create a picture for it. So uh, today is going to be Q&A Saturday. And what Q&A Saturday means is that we answer questions about anything related to anything you want to ask about, whether it's art, whether it's art marketing, whether it's uh, some of the things I've been discussing lately, like motivation, et cetera. So start thinking about your questions and we'll put them in the comments section. Uh, remember, we have prizes for comments. Today's prize is my book. This book, it's called Make More Money Selling Your Art. It's a number one Amazon bestseller. And I'm going to give away one copy of this today. So uh, that's for comments. Make sure you say where you're from. Uh, I wanted to tell you a couple things that I thought were pretty exciting. First off, um, we have a video coming out with the great Russian master, Nikolai Blochin. Uh, we went to Russia right before COVID. I went and spent a week in Russia. Uh, I spent uh, five days with Nikolai Blochin doing this portrait and also doing a drawing uh, demonstration. And to watch this thing come together. And this guy, you know, his stuff is selling for six, $800,000. And to, to learn how he did this. Now, Blokin was a, a master from the great uh, Repin Academy for many, many years. And of course he was trained there, but then he became one of the one of the instructors for many years. Not, then he went out on his own. So uh, that's coming up, I, I think uh, in another couple of months it may be, but I just wanted to tell you about it because it's pretty cool. The other thing that's cool that I wanted to tell you about is I learned yesterday that Plein Air Magazine is going into 278 Michaels stores, and that is huge for us. That's uh, First off, that's, I guess, something uh, we've been working on for several years, and it's just now happening. Michaels has finally realized... Uh, thank you to them, uh, that plein air painting is a big deal. And so plein air magazine is going to be in the Michaels stores. And so I'm going to encourage you guys. It's not coming out until the October, November issue. Uh, the first one will be October, November. But I want to encourage you guys, even if you have a copy of plein air magazine, go into a Michaels store in October, November and buy a copy so they sell out because we want them to to feel the confidence because they always, you know, everything's about the numbers. We're going to be up by the cash registers right before. And so that is pretty cool. We're very proud of that. And so um, thank you for making that happen. I want to also tell you guys about Realism Live. Now, uh, some people say, well, what is realism? So realism is something where you can actually tell what it is, right? Realism now, and there's various forms of realism. There's tight, what I call academic or classical realism. There's loose realism. So uh, something might be might be loose, something might be tight. We cover all forms of realism. So this would be uh, this would be a very tight academic drawing. This is from Juliet Aristides. Uh, this is a uh, fairly tight, but but much looser from Juliet uh, Juliet Aristides, a, a painting that she's done probably did that from life. Uh, we also just have a, a new uh, 
person to announce it's coming on board with. Dan Gerhartz has just joined the lineup of Realism Live. And Dan Gerhartz, of course, is a, is a great painter. Comes out of, uh, I think, out of Milwaukee, or not Milwaukee, but out of Wisconsin. And uh, so he's just joined us on the faculty for Plein Air Live. I, excuse me, I said Plein Air Live, didn't I? I'm confusing things. So it's Realism Live. Uh, there it is, Realism Live. And uh, so we have faculty now, including the two I just mentioned, Juliet Aristides and Dan Gerhartz. We have Daniel Sprick. We have Joshua LaRock. We have Rose Franson. Uh, we have Graydon Parrish and many more to be announced. And we're going to be doing, again, things like this will be, this is looser realism. This is tighter realism. This is Graydon Parrish. This is uh, this is uh, Rose Franson. Uh, we're going to be doing portraiture. We're going to be doing still life. We're going to be doing landscape. We're going to be doing floral. Uh, so there's a combination of a lot of different things. And I'll, these are the faculty members that we had at the FACE conference. Now we're working with some of these people to bring them into the Realism Live conference. But you'll want to get signed up for that. It's in October. It's called Realism Live, and you can find it at realismlive.com. We've already sold over 600 seats and uh, we really just announced it at uh, Plein Air Live. And, and that'll give you a little bit of an indication because uh, we announced it at Plein Air Live and those people had a chance to sign up and 600 of the people watching Plein Air Live uh, uh, signed up. So that's pretty cool. And uh, that means that they're interested and, and that makes us feel good. Uh, so anyway, uh, let's see, what else have I got? I thought I had some other news. Um, Oh yeah, Dan uh, Dan Marshall, Daniel Marshall is going to be doing today cityscapes in watercolor at our 3 p.m. and that's on YouTube or Facebook at Streamline Art Video. So if you want to see that, Dan is actually uh, aside from being a, a very well known, uh, very accomplished watercolor artist, you can see his work here. Uh, he is also a, a world renowned tattoo artist, and so. Uh, he that's how how he made his his living initially, and now uh, he's doing things like this. And this is his cityscapes and watercolor, and we're going to see that today at 3 p.m. on Streamline uh, at Streamline Art Video on YouTube or Facebook. Okay, so I want to go to the Q and A Saturday portion of things. Uh, it is as I mentioned yesterday; it's about 80 degrees in here. It's really really hot. I can't turn the air conditioners on because it's so noisy. You're going to hear all this whining noise. And so I got to turn them off for uh, getting through this. But we'll go to the comments and see if anybody's got anything. Uh, hoping we, the, somebody said, hoping we'll get a watercolor realism artist as well. Actually, Kim, uh, we, uh, we haven't announced it yet, but we're working on watercolor live and we're going to be doing that in January. Uh, so something will be coming up about that soon. We're just getting our faculty together now. Uh, and because of the virtual situation, it's very hard for us to have multiple stages. Uh, we, you know, it, it's just at it, 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 our other events, we'll do stages for watercolor, stages for, for pastel and so on. And so as a result, we decided to go ahead and do something specially for watercolor as well. So that will solve that problem for you. Uh, but please keep that under your hat right now because we don't want anybody to steal that yet. Uh, hello from Egypt. Hello, Egypt. Uh, today we have a celebration in Egypt. Uh, just dropped in to say a quick hello. Well, tell us what you're celebra celebrating uh, because we'd be curious. It must be a um, holiday over there. So we'll find out more about that. Here Chantel says, uh, let's see, these things are moving so fast I can't really grab them. Okay. Do I have any advice for doing an exhibition of our students with the COVID uh, carefulness, of course? Uh, shall I exhibit as well? What kind of marketing? Thank you. Um, well, I think what everybody's doing right now is they're doing virtual, and virtual is working for a lot of people. Uh, you'll have to figure out the technology aspects. Uh, you know, there's some virtual software specifically for that purpose, but there's also, you know, you can do it with a, uh, you can do a video uh, the, the key to this is somebody told me they watched the virtual from one of the plein air events and uh, they were selling paintings, but they found it very difficult to buy. You want someone to be able to click through and buy right now. And so, uh, and, and maybe you do it as a, as a zoom call or something and you show them and you talk about them and you kind of do it like um, home shopping network 
where they'll talk about something for a certain period of time until something is sold out. Maybe you can do it the same way. That might be a way to do it. And of course, auctions are a great way because auctions have a tendency to drive prices up. So uh, I hope that answered your question. Should you exhibit as well? I think, sure, why not? I think what you want to do is say, uh, you know, this is a work of my my students, uh, but this is the teacher's work. And, and well, you just don't want the students to feel like you're competing with them. So just be careful about that. You might want to show your work, but not sell it there and just say, you know, here, this is the work of the student. Uh, this is what Chantel Julian does. And then here's the work of the, of this, yeah, or here's the work of the instructor. Here's the work of the students, et cetera. So um, anyway, I hope that helps. Let's see if there's any other, uh, let's see here. Okay. Well, have I, okay. Do I have any words of encouragement, motivation for somebody stepping out as a full-time professional artist following a job redundancy? Um, I'm not sure exactly what you mean by a job redundancy, but I assume that you mean you're, you're uh, leaving your old job and now you're going out as a professional full-time artist. Well, I, I was talking to my dad the other day, and I'll just tell you this. Now, this is probably not what you're going to want to hear, but um, it's he was he was talking about how uh, when he was young, he started his business uh, while he lived with his folks. He started he did it in high school, and he started a photography business doing the yearbooks, the photos for the yearbooks, and so on. And so he was making money, and yet he was able to save money because he lived at home. When I started my first business, my first business was in the candle business at age 14. Uh, well, I did, you know, I did lemonade stands when I was a little kid, but, um, and I was able to start my business uh, while I was living at home. Now that business was a complete and utter failure because I didn't know what I was doing. So it was a good thing I was living at home. Uh, and so it's always nice if you have, uh, if you want to be an artist and you want to start your business as an artist, in my art, a marketing video. It's called How to Be a Successful Full-Time Artist. Um, what, what I talk about is the overlap. So here you have, this is the income you have. And if you quit your job, you've got no income. But you've got this income and you want to be a full-time artist. So the goal is to get the art income up to this level or higher. But if you just quit, it won't start that way. So what I suggest is work on the art income and uh, wait until you get the art income equal to or a little bit more than the work income and then drop the work income. And so that's hard to do because that means you're working 12 hour days uh, after work and so on, but that's the best way. Then you've got some security that you're getting to know the way to do things. You're getting to, way, getting to know how to sell things and, and, and learning things that, you know, if you go cold turkey, then all of a sudden you've got to have, you're going to be burning up money to live. Now that's okay. So, and you may be doing that. Uh, if you are stepping out as full-time artist, uh, then you can do it, but you just want to make sure that you're managing your expenses because, you know, marketing takes time, getting your name out there takes time, uh, getting people familiar with you, selling your work and so on takes time. Actually, a lot of people are telling me they're selling more work than ever during these COVID eras. And people are now more accustomed, of course, to, to virtual things and online things. And so it, it, you can use that to your advantage right now. But uh, look, anybody can do this. Anybody can do it. As, as long as your painting is, is somewhat decent, somewhat accomplished, as long as people like what you're painting, then you can do this. And it's a matter of learning how to get out there and learning how to push to uh, to essentially get uh, you know to get noticed, and so that's a process. So if you can begin that process before you leave your other job, you're a little better off. You also have that job to kind of fund it for you, which is is kind of a nice thing. So I hope hope that was helpful. Uh, ceiling fans will help whenever you you run your air conditioners. You know, I hadn't thought about that, Carol. Thank you for that. I probably I don't know. This building is so old. I don't know if it would support a ceiling fan. But uh, that's a really great idea, and uh, they will support the air conditioners and get that heat moving around, maybe moving out. So uh, let's see. Here's something from Hunter Guys. Thank you, Eric, for the tip about uh, Mijelo pallets. I got a white one. I love it. This per per fits perfectly in my small freezer and can load it up with a lot of paint. Yeah, that's what I'm using. Uh, 
that's what this is. Um, it's gray. It's got a lid on it. And I can put my paint on the inside. This one's kind of a mess. And then I have my, I put my gray palette paper there. And that way it keeps my paint dry longer. Sometimes if I also want to extend my paint life, I'll put a drop, not more than a drop of uh, clove oil. But if you put too much in it, it'll never dry. So you want to be careful about that. Uh, but yes, uh, you're welcome. And uh, I don't think they, they're making the gray ones anymore. But uh, uh, dehumanizing helps too. I think you mean dehumidifying helps. All right. <laughs> What is the uh, what is the best website to form an artist website? I don't do recommendations. Uh, I try very carefully. We have a lot of a lot of companies who advertise with us, and you've got to find what works best for you. Now there are people who do it specially, especially for artists. Uh, there are people. There, there's you know websites now are a commodity. You can get them done dirt cheap. You can go on, uh, and there's you know a million places that make websites, you can go on and, you know, make it for almost nothing. But if you find something that can benefit you in some other way as an artist, then you could, you could look at that. The key is you want to find something that's going to save you time and make it easy for you. Uh, okay. Here's a question. If you ever went enter one painting in different categories for plein air salon, do you pay only for the painting or do you pay for each category? You pay for each entry that you, you do Joe Beth. Uh, the, uh, but the, uh, the first entry in most competitions is always higher. And then there's uh, lower prices for second, third entries and so on. So that's how it works is that you, you pay by category, you pay every time you enter. Uh, and that's how that works. Okay. Uh, lost my job due to COVID downturn here in business. I'm sorry to hear that. I won't mention your name. Uh, let's see if there's any other questions on here. What, what, what canvas carrier do I recommend? Gail, again, I don't make recommendations because all these people are my advertisers. And the minute I recommend one over another, they're going to hate me. Uh, but I will tell you that uh, there's there's kind of uh, three kinds of carriers, um, maybe even more. Somebody at uh, the Adirondacks last year took uh, little clips, little metal clips, and they they somehow put them back to back and they made, made it so you could clip two canvases together without them touching and you just need four of those. That's a, a cheap way out. Another thing I learned when I was really young is just to um, to put, you know, like nickels in the corner or something and then you can kind of rubber band things together. Those are the ways you do it. But I, I like to use products. Um, there's a kind called panel pack, which is basically a, like a thin picture frame. I don't have one in here. Uh, but uh, basically, you can sandwich two paintings together and throw it in your backpack. It's real easy. Now, also, Brian Mark Taylor Strata makes one uh, of those. His is made out of metal. Uh, the EZL uh, Artwork Essentials people make one. Theirs has little sliding clips, uh, and there may be others. Uh, and then there's the the boxes. They're kind of a um, kind of a thick plasticky like cardboard and you can slip six or eight panels, maybe five or six panels in those uh, face to face to face uh, so they don't touch. And uh, there's a company called Raymar, which is a big advertiser of ours. There's a company called Gorilla Painter, which is a big advertiser of ours. And both of those make those and carry them. And I suspect that you can find other ones too. Then there are wooden boxes. Now people like Rick Wilson, uh, who comes up to the Adirondacks every year, he has a big wooden box that he made with slots in it so that his paintings don't get destroyed when he throws luggage and stuff on top of it when he's traveling in his car. And he can, you know, he can keep a lot of wet paintings in there. Uh, that's great for your car. If you're getting on an airplane, it gets a little heavy. So you might want to think about that. Okay. Here's an, a question from Angie says, how to best realize, uh, utilize digital marketing? Uh, I haven't talked a lot about digital marketing and I'm trying to get really, really good at it. Now, I will tell you that uh, we have an ad agency that works for us and that age, ad agency does a lot of the digital marketing work for us because we realized that even though we were doing it ourselves, we realized it's become so complex that we needed somebody who could focus on it full time. And uh, we have a full-time person who does digital marketing for us, and we're still doing that, but we needed to get to a higher level because it's harder and harder to get results. It's harder and harder to get them to push your stuff out there. 
And we do spend a lot of money in digital marketing, but we spend a lot of money in all marketing. We we don't ever want to have what I call the, you know, the pillar problem, right? Imagine that you've got the Parthenon and you got the top on the Parthenon and you got all these different pillars holding it up. If if you get to the point where there's one pillar, uh, the the top is going to come crumbling down, right? Uh, you know, or you're in the uh, and the other way to put that is if you have all of your business relying on one source of income or one source of marketing, and that gets yanked out, uh, then you're you're in trouble. Uh, so let me use TikTok as an example. Tick, not not a lot of people are advertising with TikTok yet, but there are people doing that. If your entire world was based on TikTok, right now you've got uh, that they, they've just learned that China has been in, owns it. They know this and has been using it as a spy tool. And so they're talking about actually making it illegal to be in the United States because of this. So if your entire business were based on TikTok, suddenly it would disappear. If your entire business were based on Facebook or Instagram and there was some regulation or something, it would disappear. Now, the other thing that happened about two years ago, uh, the major advertisers started realizing that it was a good thing for them to embrace and so they started throwing 50, 75, 100 million dollars at, at these platforms. And what happened is it drove the prices up and it made it almost impossible for small people like me to even get noticed. And so, uh, you know, a lot of people ask me, should I hit the boost button? No, the boost button, first off, statistically, it doesn't help. Secondly, it just absolutely is just a way to throw money away from what I'm told from our experts is that you know you you have to do it in a very specific way, very targeted, and then you've got to find a way to buy a targeted audience that is actually going to work for you. And you're you're ended up paying, uh, we end up paying a dollar twenty, two dollars, three dollars per person who sees sees every ad. And so don't think of it as as cheap. Now I can do a lot of other ad media as well, and I do. I buy magazine ads, I buy digital banners, I, I do direct mail, I do emails, I, you know, I do a lot of things because you don't want all those things relying on a single pillar. So uh, how to best utilize digital marketing? Um, I, I don't know that there's a best for you, Angie, but I think that best uh, implies that one thing is better than the other and, and everything has to be adjusted based on your particular strategy, and then what are the tactics that you employ for your strategy? You know, it, digital marketing, uh, a, lot of, a lot of artists are relying on social media because they spend so much time on social media, they're assuming everybody else does, and we all spend a lot of time on social media. But getting ads noticed on social media is, uh, first off, it's about the proper placement. Uh, secondly, it's... it's um, Kind of a roll of the dice. Thirdly, is the creative's got to be good because I don't know about you, but I scroll past 98, 99% of the things that I'm looking at. Uh, and maybe they make an impression, maybe they don't. But they, you know, you're scrolling by pretty fast. Imagine that you're driving down the road and you glance up and you see a billboard and uh and and you know you keep driving. You know, you've got a split second impression because you're driving, man. And so uh this is even a faster impression than that, and it's hard to get impressions there. So um, I, I would be really cautious about it. Uh, I, I I think that the other thing that's misunderstood is we think if we have, let's say we say I've got 5,000 friends on Facebook, which is the limit I'm allowed to have unless I go to a public page, which I've never done. And there are reasons I've done I've not done that. I want to be able to interact and communicate and see what other people are doing. But um, I do have a public page on one of my pages. So if I make a post, I'm clicking that, I put that post out there, I'm assuming that 5,000 people are going to see that. But it's not true. Facebook says that they only push it out to 4% and that number is going down. So only 4% of the people, and it tends to be the same 4%. Uh, there are ways that you can engage people and 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 get more activity on your Facebook so that they will push more things out. But if you're thinking, well, everybody's going to see this because I'm pushing it out. Well, 
just think of it as, as four out of a hundred are going to see it. And so you've got to make sure you've got repetition. You've got to make sure that you've got other ways to push things. So I hope that's helpful. Uh, let's see here. Just, uh, let's see. How's that new AC working for you? Well, I'm sweating. <laughs> okay. Uh, how do you go about copywriting artwork? Um, well, uh, the first thing, first off, I'm not a lawyer and I can't give you legal advice. And so don't rely on my advice. Uh, I, on the back of every painting, I don't have, I don't want to go all the way back there, but on the back of every painting, I do uh, a circle C. Let's see if I could do this for you real quickly. Um, hang on a second. I do a circle C, uh, the year, my name. Hang on a second. I'm going to type it out. Bear with me. Okay. Now, can you see that? I do a circle C. That's for copyright. It's copyright 2020 B. Eric Rhodes, all rights reserved. That's putting my name on it. All rights reserved is really important because otherwise, if, uh, you know, somebody could copy copy your painting. Now I will do more on the back of the painting and, and there is a process that you can go through uh, to actually copyright individual paintings. It's all online. You can do that. I don't do it. And I don't do it because I don't really want to spend the money or the time to do it. And I, I won a very significant case. Someone violated a copyright that I owned. And because I had uh, essentially had this on there and could prove it was on there at the time these other people started using that particular copyright. I, uh, I hired an attorney and uh, we basically got them to settle out of court because they didn't want to take it to court because, you, you know, if you have uh, documentation and proof. But uh, there's a podcast that I did. I don't know the name of the guy off the top of my head, but it was about six months or a year ago. You go back in my podcast at Plein Air Podcast, I interviewed a copyright attorney and he could probably uh, help you out with that. He gave a lot of comments on that and, and how to do it properly and how people make mistakes and so on. So that might be helpful. Uh, here it says to register a copyright, go to copyright.gov, register one unpublished work for $35 or group for about uh, 10 for $55. Okay. And again, I don't do that, uh, but I'm not making my living selling my art. So if somebody copies me, I'll be flattered. All right. Um, okay. Let's see here. What else? See if there's any other. Now it's been 128 days. How do, now it's been 128 days. How do you see the former art infrastructure evolving? Galleries, museums, outdoor shows, competitions. What a great question. Very insightful question. Um, well, first off, nobody knows what's going to happen. Nobody knows how this is going to go. And we don't know if this COVID thing is a short-term or a long-term problem. And uh, as a result, we don't know how that's going to impact the economy. And so the economy is what this all comes down to. And, and in 2008, uh, lots of galleries, two, 300 galleries went out of business. Uh, lots of artists stopped selling a lot of artwork. And there were still artists who sell artwork because some artists understand that you got to keep marketing no matter what. And the people who keep marketing when things are bad are the ones who always win. The ones who say, well, everybody knows who I am. I'll just stop marketing. They're wrong. Everybody forgets you very quickly. And so uh, you got to stay, stay ahead of it. So the former art infrastructure, first off, um, I don't think museums are going to be a huge problem. The, the, the problem with art galleries or the gallery or the problem art galleries oftentimes face is they have massive amounts of rent. You know, I, I know art galleries that pay 50, 75, a hundred thousand dollars a month. And you got to sell a lot of paintings to do that. Well, if you're going to maintain your space when you can't sell anything for three or four months, that's going to hurt a lot of art galleries. And of course, landlords want to be paid. If you own your building, it's a little different unless you're making payments on it. Because if you can't make your payments, then all of a sudden you're not able to make payments. You lose your building if you can't pay your taxes. And so it's going to depend on 
uh, the, the nature of the galleries, the debt they have, and so on. The one thing that I think I learned from this, uh, and I think everybody has learned from this, is you cannot just live hand to mouth. You've got to always have a backup plan. You want to have, you always, you know, it's very easy when you get some extra money to say, well, this is, you know, things are going well. I'm going to continue to do uh, well. And so I'm going to go ahead and buy that new car, get that new car payment. And that's when we get into trouble because it is, uh, I, you know, if I'm buying a car, I pay cash for it. I wait till I can, I had a car that I drove for 14 years, no, 17 years. And uh, when I bought a new car, I waited until I had enough money saved so I could buy the whole thing. I didn't want to make somebody rich by making payments. And I didn't want to have payments in case my business got bad. Well, guess what? It got bad. And I would not be able to make those payments as, as a result. So I think that we're seeing, you know, Yelp says that 25% of all the restaurants that closed down during COVID will never open again. That's huge. And so a lot of these people were living hand to mouth. You know, they had a, a, enough money to pay their bills. Uh, we have uh, a, a lot of small business people spend beyond their means uh, and they, you know, they buy things that they think they're successful because they have cash flow. But the minute the cash flow stops, they don't have that success anymore. So I think the thing that's going to be the biggest impact is we're going to see a lot of businesses who don't survive because they don't have the cash to survive. Uh, we're going to see a lot of people start thinking about putting money away when they can and saving some for a rainy day. Because, you know, you could go for a year or two years uh, without any income, and could you survive that? And so you've got to ask yourself, you know, how can I get ready for that in the future? And you know, it's not easy. It takes a lot of discipline. Uh, I have always been—I haven't always been that guy. I mean, I got in trouble with the IRS when I owed them two hundred thousand dollars because I had a sixty thousand dollar loan that ended up being interest-free. Uh, by mistake, because we didn't document it correctly, and the penalties were $200,000. So it took me 10 years to get out of that hole. And after that, I started paying closer attention. So I started, you know, operating conservatively and not spending a ton of money on things. And so uh, that's, you know, that's what's going to happen is that people are going to have to learn how to be conservative. Now, in terms of outdoor shows and competitions, uh, we want them to remain strong. And so when we have virtual shows, we all want to encourage everybody to buy things because uh, a lot of artists made their living on shows. A lot of these communities raised money on these shows, charities and so on. And so we want to do what we can to to help them uh, survive. And that's the true for galleries and, and, and so on. Museums, I think, will be OK. Now, uh, if we're always you know, if we're always in quarantine for the rest of our lives, uh, we got a bigger problem than than that. But I think museums will be okay because most museums don't have, um, you know, they have expenses, but they don't necessarily have to pay for buildings. Maybe they do. I don't know. So I, I anyway, I don't know if I answered your question, Deborah, but it was a good question. Uh, let's see here. Do, 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 do. Um, there are battery operated fans that work. Oh, thank you for that. Okay. Um, okay, so I think we're kind of avoid debt. Great art lesson or great life lesson, says somebody here. Okay, see if there's any other questions. If not, I'm just going to turn the air conditioning back on and say goodbye. Let's see here. I apologize. I got to take some time to read. Hello, Northern Illinois. Hello, Lakeway, Texas, just down the road from me normally. Uh, can I get, okay. Everybody's talking about how to cool this. Oh, let me tell you how we're doing it. We have a, a local uh, carpenter who came over the other day and he's going to cut a vent in the ceiling so that the heat will go out. It won't be very good if I have to heat the room, but, uh, he's going to cut in the seal a vent in the ceiling for $500. So that's a pretty good deal. Okay. So if you don't have any other questions, we're going to go. I want to tell you, remind you again today at 3 PM, we have Daniel Marshall, uh, and uh, he's going to be talking about cityscapes and watercolor. Uh, you'll see how he did this. And uh, pretty cool, if you missed it, we're going to go into Michael's store starting in October, 278 stores nationally with Plein Air Magazine. But you should have a subscription, but go buy one anyway. It's going to cost you 10 bucks or 12 bucks, and you can give it to somebody. All right. 
Well, thanks for watching Q&A Saturday. I'll check the comments one last time. Uh, oh, here, here's some. Good. All right. 103 in Fresno today. I used to live in Fresno. Uh, let's see here. Good wishes from Southampton, England. Okay, here it is. What is the best way to photograph our art for competitions? Uh, there's uh, the biggest complaint that I hear from art competitions, uh, a biggest complaint we have, the biggest complaint I hear from uh, others, galleries, et cetera, is when artists photograph their own work, they think they're doing a good job if they take their iPhone out and they're, and they're taking a picture of it or they take their camera out but you want to have a multi megapixel camera and you want to uh, there's we have a video at Lil at all on how to how to photograph artwork and so i i can't tell you the whole thing cuz it's hours worth of stuff but essentially uh, you want to have a polarizer filter on your camera uh, polarizer gets rid of glare you want to have two polarized lights at each end kind of raking a, a, across the painting and uh, and then you want to have it on a tripod. You want to have, a, you know, really good light so you get enough light so it's not shaky. And then you want to uh, you want to get it done. Now that's one one way. The a lot of artists, uh, most of the pros actually have a professional photographer who just comes over and gets their stuff and goes and photographs it and brings it back. Most of them don't varnish before it's photographed. But if you do have areas that are sunk in, then you'll need some retouch varnish or something on there, but you don't want it to be shiny yet. And then uh, the latest, greatest thing really is scanning. Uh, uh, they make these giant flatbed scanners and you can lay a, a painting on, uh, on a really good professional scanner and you're gonna get even better quality than a photograph in most cases. Uh, now, there are people who would debate that, but um, so that's an option. And I have friends who did that. They, I recommended it and they had a print made of a famous painting that they owned and then they sold the famous painting and they said they have a hard time telling the difference uh, because the colors are perfectly accurate. The other thing you wanna do is get a color bar. You can go to a photography store or go online and get a color bar. It's, it's basically got a grayscale on it, but it's also got the, uh, the, the printer's colors and that way they can adjust it just perfectly. The problem that we have constantly with artists when they're submitting works for articles and other things is they think they look good on their own computers, but they don't look good on the printer's computer. And the printer's computer is calculated. They have these hoods around them so light doesn't come in. And they have these devices they put right up on the screen so that make sure that they measure the color properly. And so uh, people are submitting things all the time. And, and then, you know, if something doesn't come out right, they, they think it's our fault when in reality, it's them putting together a, a bad photograph. And so you've got to make sure that you get it right. And that's why having pros, because pros have calculated computers. And, you know, ultimately, somebody told me, oh, I was talking yesterday to, um, to somebody. Let's see, who was it? Anyway, he was telling me that he's taking his life's work and putting it into a coffee table book. And I thought, well, that's great. I hope he has really good photographs because, you know, I, I know sometimes I'll take a snapshot of something and then sell it to somebody. And then I wish I had, you know, I wish I had it later if I were going to do a book or I was going to do an article or something. So there's a lot of things like that. Um, all right. So here's one. Any ideas on how to best market my short film about the artist Rockwell Kent to the art community? Eric, uh, Rockwell Kent is one of my favorite artists. And I'll have to tell you this story real quickly. I was at the um, the Palm Beach Art Show. We hosted a big party at this big mansion. Uh, we had all these art collectors and we had our guest of honor was um, the, the uh, head, the director of the Hermitage, which is in, in Russia. And that's the first time I met him and, and got to know him. And we were talking and uh, uh, he said that his favorite artist was Rockwell Kent. Well, I, I live in the Adirondacks part of the year and, and Rockwell Kent lived up here. I've painted on his farm many times. We were going to go to his farm and paint this year for our Adirondack event. Anyway, so uh, his studio is there and it's some stuff still in it. So I, uh, I had been in a bookstore uh, two days earlier and I saw a, an original signed autographed Rockwell Kent book and I hadn't bought it because it was you know, it was expensive and I didn't think I needed it. So I, I quickly got on the cell phone. I called my wife. I said, um, 
FedEx that book to me, go into the store and FedEx it to me. And I gave it to him the next day and, and he'll remember me forever for that. Right. But we become friends. Every time I go to Russia, I go to the, the Hermitage, we hang out in his office and we, we talk, uh, Peter Trippi and I were over there recently together and, and we talked to him. Um, and I, I was over there three, four months ago and filming a documentary. So, uh, anyway, uh, Rockwell Kent is uh, means a lot to me. And so Rockwell Kent has this history. He was a communist. He had this history of uh, doing, you know, paintings. A lot of his paintings are in Russia now. As a matter of fact, when I, I forgot to tell you this part of the story. So when Peter and I went to meet with uh, uh, the director of the Hermitage, he said, Eric, I've got a surprise for you. I said, really, what is it? He says, come with me. So uh, he picks up the phone, he calls a couple of people, and he says, is it ready? Uh, yes. So what he did is he mounted a special exhibition of Rockwell Kent paintings, knowing that we were coming to town. And they become part. They became part of an exhibition they did in the Hermitage, but they opened it up, and we were the first to see it. Uh, and we got to just spend time in there seeing this, which was very, very cool and very generous of him. So uh, I owe him big time. Anyway, you need to put that story in your documentary somehow. I don't know how we do that, but I do have some photos of that. But the best ways to market your short film about the artist Rockwell Kent to the art community. Well, you have to, the first thing you have to ask yourself is what do you want to accomplish? Always start with that uh, because we, we talk about, well, I want to, I want to market my short film to artist is what you're saying. But what if artists don't want it? What if somebody else wants it? What is the best way that's going to get you the best distribution, the best viewing? Uh, you have to ask yourself, what is your purpose? Do you want more people to see it? Because if you just market to artists, you're going to miss an entire market of people who would love to know the story about Rockwell Kent. And by the way, I was in the uh, Plattsburgh airport up here, Plattsburgh, they have a Rockwell Kent Museum and they have an exhibit in the airport of his original works as well. So uh, what you wanna do is ask yourself, first off, is this the outcome I want? What other outcome might I want? You wanna dream big. And then, uh, and then you start asking yourself, okay, now that I know that outcome, how, who are the people? You know, what age are they? Where do they live? You know, try to get as much detail as you possibly can. And then once you know that, that develops your strategy. Now, once you have the strategy, you say, okay, what do I need to do to reach those people? What do I need to do to reach these goals? Do you want to have a very narrow defined strategy? Because if it's broad, if it says, well, I'll just want to go after everybody, you'll never, never get very effective. But if, if it's narrow, you'll know exactly who to go after. So uh, give me a call, Eric, send me an email. I'd love to know more about it. Maybe I can help you with that. We have a TV channel on uh, Roku and um, uh, and Amazon Fire. It's called Paint Tube. Uh, we are going to be on Apple TV starting, I think, next week or two weeks. So uh, we might be able to put it on there, and that might be a way to get some exposure for it. So uh, anyway, maybe that'll help. Let's see if I can find how to turn your comment off. There it is. Okay. Uh, where would we Where would we go to find a scanner like that, Corey? Uh, you call a professional uh, printing company. And you say, who does scans? Or you could look, you know, look and look online and just I start to say, look at the phone book. Uh, you know, who does professional scanning? And uh, yes, it's RGB versus CMYK. And um, somebody said, all right, uh, I always place the painting next to the photo, making sure the colors are right. Uh, I think that's right. Uh, but if your camera, uh, you know, if anything's off in calculations, that's why you want to have a color bar under there because the color bar isn't for you. It's for the person who's reproducing it because that way, if their screen is off, they can match it to the color bar. All right. Judith just logged in from Maine. Hello, Judith. Okay. Uh, my dear friend owned Rockwell Kent's home and studio on Monhegan Island. She donated both to the museum. That's cool, Jock. That's very cool. All right. Uh, let's see. I absolutely, Vicki Swenson says, I absolutely recommend a professional photograph over scanning continuous tone as opposed to dots. Okay. The real issue is having a real good printer doing the printing on large ink jet style printers, making the G clay G clay is a printout of your painting. Make sure that they are dedicated to being true to the original, and not pushing color. Like they often like to do with landscape photographs. I think that's a really great observation. 
All right. Uh, History Channel. Mary Phillips says History Channel, probably for the, the Rockwell. I think that's a good idea. Okay, I don't see any more questions. And uh, so I hope you guys have a really great day. Today is a lake day. Today, uh, I went out and I bought one of those um, floating things that you lay on. And I'm going to go into the water and lay on it. And that's all I'm going to do today. Well, probably I won't do it all day because I don't want to get a sunburn. So you guys have a great day. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, we will be here tomorrow. Tomorrow will be day number 129. You know, they just keep stacking up. Be sure to watch the Dan Marshall video today at, uh, at um, 3 o'clock. Also, uh, let's see here. Uh, let's see. Judith says... I use a gray card next to the painting. I think that's also good. All right. And Kathleen says, I photograph on a cloudy but otherwise bright day outdoors. Yeah, I know some people who do that. And it works pretty effectively. Clouds act like a, a, uh, a filter over your light, which is nice. Why do wear, artists wear hats indoors? You know, that's a great question. All right. My wife says I look silly in hats. Okay, so the way you, the reason I wear hats and the way the reason everybody else wears hats, first off, outdoors, you're wearing a hat for two reasons. Number one is you want to keep the sunburn off your neck. And so I like a big floppy hat. Doesn't look very good, but I'm not worried about that. Uh, what I'm trying to do is to cut out the glare coming into my eyes. You know, the, the light is hitting in a lot of different areas and it, it creates glare and it, it, uh, it opens up or closes down your irises. And, and so as a result, you're not necessarily seeing things as accurate. I have a big light over my easel or I did, I now have them in the ceiling and it would, it would just kind of create a little bit of a problem for me. So it just kind of keeps the light off of my eyes. That's why we wear hats. Anybody else want to answer that question? Uh, glare. Yes. Glare from lights. Photoshop is the only ac uh, is only accurate to your monitor unless you're calibrated with a printer. That's correct. That's absolutely correct. Okay, um, that's it, guys. Thank you. I've gone uh, rambling, rambling, rambling. And so, any other questions, put them in now or forever hold your peace. We do this on Saturdays, and uh, I think that's it. Thank you for watching today. Have a terrific day. It is. Now about 120 degrees in here, so I'm anxious to actually get out of the room. Have yourself a great day. Uh, William Schneider wears hats. Yes, he does. Uh, Impressionists wore hats to paint. Everybody wears.